Thank you. Absolutely. Here. You found it? Yeah, I, I did. How thankful we are. Can I hand it to him? Does it still work? <laughs> yep, still working. Thank you so much, Tessa. Awesome. Thank you. What's up guys, it's Brian again from Lake Hickory Scuba Marina. And if you are new to our channel, do me a huge favor. Make sure you click this little subscribe button over here and ding that little bell as well. That way you guys will be notified every time we upload new content. Now we got another search and recovery video coming today. We're headed out to look for a guy's lost iPhone. But I got a new videographer with us. I've got my oldest daughter, Tessa, here with us. Say hey, Tessa. Hi. And so she's going to be filming everything on land for us, and of course I'll be filming underwater for you. Now a couple things that I want to get across in this video is first of all, I'm going to be doing this solo, so a solo diver situation. I wouldn't encourage anyone to go out here and do these searches solo unless you have the proper training. Number two, there's going to be quite a few entanglement hazards. Not only am I going to be up underneath a dock looking for the cell phone, I'm also going to be up underneath a boat lift itself. So I've got the dock and I've got the boat lift to contend with, and it is going to create some entanglement hazards but with that being said i'm going to show you some tips and tricks that i use to not only make this dive more successful but also a lot safer as well we've got a couple more miles to get down the road here then we're going to jump into the water and hopefully have a safe and successful search hey you matt yeah hey man i'm brian nice to see you lost cell phone huh yep that's what we got here all right show me where it's at yeah. All right, guys, here you can see I'm getting ready for the dive, and I'm still talking to the owner here just to make sure he understands everything that I'm going to be doing. Now, I do a ton of search and recovery diving that is solo diving, so I always make sure I file a good dive plan. I let my business partner, which is my dad, know where I'm at. I'll text my wife, let her know where I'm at, and I kind of give them my dive plan, what I think is going to be the depth that I'm going to be at, how long I'm going to be searching. Now, my daughter is filming for me today, and she's got a cell phone. Obviously, she can dial 911, but I still want to file that dive plan anytime I'm doing any type of solo diving. I want to make sure all my gear is in good working order. I want to make sure I don't have any type of entanglement hazards. One thing that you'll notice is I've got a short tank. I'm only using a 63 cubic foot tank. You wouldn't think that's something that you would want to use during a solo diving operation. And, and typically I wouldn't be using a 63. However, where I'm going to be diving at, it's very, very close quarters. And I'm not going to have a lot of room to actually operate if I got this big bulky tank or doubles or side mount or something like that. So I'm using it. You'll notice all my hoses are nicely and um, kind of routed. Even my dry suit hose, which I leave on this particular rig all the time, I've got it um, secured in behind the cam straps of the tank. So I've got everything nice and secure. There's really no type of entanglement hazards that um, can cause any problems for me underwater. I'm also going to be setting a reference line, which you guys have seen me do this in plenty of videos. So here I'm going to be dropping a reference line straight down. This is going to do a couple things. One, it's going to allow me to easily navigate the area that I'm at. It's also going to keep me uh, in the area that I need to be searching anyway. So as I descend down to that, I know it's going to be general. The object I'm looking for is going to be in that general area. Um, one thing I'm not going to be doing though is jumping in right there. I need to find a safe place to get in and what I've decided to do here because this is a new part of the lake I'm not used to is to do a uh, controlled seated entry versus a giant stride or a rollback or something like that because I don't know what's directly underneath this dock. I could very easily jump on something, break my leg or something like that. So I'm just going to do a slow controlled seated entry making sure everything's nice and good and, and I don't injure myself in any way. But I'm going to swim over to the uh, main search area. I will descend down about three or four feet and then swim over into the line just because it's such tight quarters there. I can't actually get up in there until I'm down underneath the boat and the boat lift itself. So you'll see me, I'll actually descend down and then I'll, you'll see my bubbles kind of go uh, forward up towards the reference line. And that's where the underwater footage of this video will actually kick into play. So here I'm descending down. I'm actually just going to keep my hand on the uh, ceiling or what we call hard ceiling there um, until I get over to the reference line or my down line. 
And so I'm swimming. I've actually got one hand up above me right now. And there's my reference point or my reference line. I'm going to drop down on it. I'm going to get to the bottom and make sure I go slow, make sure I remain neutrally buoyant because I don't want to hit the bottom and all of a sudden just stir everything up. So I'm going to remain neutrally buoyant here. I'm going to give it just a really quick, quick look over, just see if the phone's there. But I'm also looking for any type of debris or anything on the bottom that would prevent me from doing, say, a circle search or anything like that. Um, and it, right off the bat, I can tell there's really not that much debris there. There's not much very light because I've got that hard ceiling above me and there's hardly any ambient light coming through. So I'm really going to have to rely on my flash light. When I do searches like this, I personally prefer a thousand loom light because I don't think it's um, too powerful enough that I'm going to have a bunch of backscatter coming back and blinding me when it hits the bottom, but I also think it's just powerful enough to really cut through some of the muck that I'm looking through right here. Uh, the search pattern that I've decided to use, I am on a slight incline, but the, the area I'm searching is not big enough to really uh, worry about my no decompression profile, if you will. So I'm actually going to be doing a circle search, but unlike a typical circle search, would I would have a pivot point and I'd be going around using a rope or a line or some type of string, I'm actually going to be using my finger. So I'm going to start my circle search on just a five foot circle. I'm literally just going to put my finger down in the muck and while I'm neutrally buoyant, I'm just going to spin around my finger. And I'm going to keep that reference point right there with me or that down line so that I always know where I'm at. And then once I've completed that, instead of having my finger here in front of me in the muck, I'm going to actually extend my hand out, stick my finger in, and that's going to extend my search, say another three or four foot. Based off this visibility, three or four foot is about all I'd really want to extend out. I wouldn't want to go much more than that. Um, but I've already made one complete circle here. I'm actually on my second pass. Um, and typically I would say go slow when you do searches like this. I do it pretty much every day, every week. So I'm used to it, especially in the depths. I'm not very deep. And then as you can see there, I come across the phone very easily. Um, one thing that we also rely on is what's called the drop radius. And so basically an object, let's say I drop this object here. As it goes down, it can go straight down, but it can also go the equal amount of distance away as what the depth is. So here in say 12 foot of water looking for this phone, that phone could have been anywhere 12 foot away from that downline itself. So I know my search area is not more than about 12 foot. Well, if I'm five foot seven, that's basically a, a complete arm span and a little bit extra. So my search pattern wasn't really going to be that big. But here as I come up, you'll see that I did start up that reference line. But as soon as I get a little bit of ambient light, I'm going to move out around it just so I don't hit the overhead there. You found it? You know, I did. How thankful we are. I hand it to him. Does it still work? Yep, still working. Thank you so much, Tessa. Awesome. Thank you. Job well done. You're still working? <laughs> yeah. Let me back up. That's probably the first time you've ever had to go get a phone, isn't it? <laughs> today. <laughs> First time today. But not the first time this week. Were you wearing a wetsuit? Yep. Oh, that's awesome, Brian. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And how? Now, so, uh... All right, guys, as you can see, we had a very, very successful search. We was able to find the cell phone in practically no time at all. Um, guys, I hope the tips and tricks that I showed you in this video help you out in the future as a search and recovery diver. And if you are doing the solo, please do it safely. Make sure that you got all your gear in the right place. Make sure you're making appropriate entries so that you don't jump on something that you shouldn't be. Um, but guys, if you did like the video, give me a huge thumbs up. As a matter of fact, if you think Tessa did a great job filming for me today, give me a huge thumbs up and definitely share this video as well. But guys, I really do hope you enjoyed the video. If you got any questions, please put it down in the comment section below. I'll try to answer your questions the best I can. But guys, as always, make sure you follow us on Instagram and Twitter, like us on Facebook, pin us on Pinterest, subscribe to us here on YouTube, and as always, guys, we appreciate your business.